Hi everyone, and um, welcome back to our Quick Reads event. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, and firstly, massive thank you to our first panel, to Fanny and all of our Quick Reads authors. Um, and also thank you to the students there from um, Burton and South Derbyshire College sharing with us um, their thoughts on Quick Reads. Um, it's great to hear from readers and I'll share a link to that video in case you want to watch it again. Um, so we'll be continuing the theme of looking at the impact of quick reads with our next panel. Um, and I'm delighted to be here to introduce the chair, Bally Rye. Um, I'm Lily and I'm the programme manager for adult reading at the Reading Agency. Um, so thank you all again for joining us. Uh, Bally is an author of over 40 children's teenage and young adult books. Um, after publishing his first book in 2001, Unarranged Marriage. He's a passionate advocate for reading and he's a brilliant ambassador for our Reading Ahead programme, which is the reading agency programme that encourages young people and adults to build up their reading confidence and their reading enjoyment. Um, and quick reads are often a key tool in that programme. So it's really brilliant to have Bally with us. Um, and I'm gonna hand over to him now so that he can introduce our next panel and get started. Brilliant, thank you Lily. Um, yes, um, good evening, I'm Bally Wright. I'm really, really delighted to be able to chair this panel. It's a practitioner panel. Um, the panel has been, this evening has been selected um, to cover four key sectors that use Quick Reads books in different ways. So we are going to be, we'll have somebody from public libraries, prison libraries, colleges, and adult literacy teaching. The aim is to share best practice or examples of best practice about how the books are used, who the books are used with, and how they fit within the sort of wider framework of promoting reading for pleasure. Please do feel free to share your questions. There's a QA and a thing at the bottom. Um, there'll be time for those at the end, and I'll try and get through as many of those as possible. But what I'd like to do, obviously, is start by introducing our panel this evening. We have James Averson, who has been one of the neighbourhood librarians for Tameside Libraries for the past two and a half years. He leads their Reading Ahead programme each year, along with various partner organisations and groups across the borough, and also assists on reader development and other adult literacy programmes for Tameside's library service. We also have with us Claire Canavan, who worked, who's worked in libraries for almost 18 years. For the past five years, it's been as the prison librarian or senior librarian assistant at HMP Downview, which is a women's prison in Surrey. Claire runs a variety of literary groups from the prison library and it's very pleasing to note here that the most popular is the quick read sessions. We have Baljinder Baines, a librarian team leader at Burton and South Derbyshire College. A qualified teacher, Baljinder has a college-wide role for supporting learning and teaching and with a particular interest in promoting reading for pleasure, literacy and information skills across the curriculum with the use of new technologies. And finally, David Reynolds, who's worked as a publishing editor since the 1970s with authors ranging from Joanna Lumley to Bob Geldof. He was one of the founders of Bloomsbury Publishing in 1986, and he's a teacher of literacy to adults and the author of three books so far. As well as his experience using quick reads in adult literacy teaching, David is also literacy editor for the Quick Reads book series, ensuring the stories are accessible for less confident readers. I think one of the best ways to start is, David, if we come to you, um, one of the questions that I have is about the process. I think it might be interesting to get a, a, a little idea of the process of editing the Quick Reads books, how that works. Yes, sure. Um, I get sent them after they've been edited by the publisher and they've gone back to the author and then to the publisher again and all that stuff's happened. Um, and I have to check that they're kind of appropriate for my perception, at least, of who the readers are. It's very much like editing any other book um, in that I try to preserve the author's voice and manner of, of writing while, if necessary, making the book clearer for, for the readers. <clears throat> the only difference is that with these books, the readers are thought to be what well, they're called emerging readers or whatever, well, however you want to put it. The, the text has to be simpler. And because I work with teaching um, adult literacy to adults, obviously to adults, um, I'm aware of who the readers are and I use the books with them and um, it, that helps me. That's why I was asked to do it in the first place. 
because I think I'm one of the few people who's a publishing editor and teaches literacy to adults. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, you find that there's, uh, there are things that crop up, there, are there kind of, you know, are, are there similarities in terms of the editing that you do? Are there particular things that crop up time and again with these tweets? Well, in the sense of preserving the author's manner of writing, yes. Um, but the, with the quick reads, there are the basic, fairly obvious things. Everything has to be shorter, like shorter words, shorter sentences, shorter paragraphs, shorter chapters. Um, there are certain rules that have been devised from, from academic studies, not by me, but by people who do that kind of thing. For example, we don't have, we try to avoid having a three syllable word more often than in than every other sentence, if you follow me. Um, and I'm always looking out for that. I'm looking out for any short words that are complex. Not all short words are okay. If you think of a word like yacht, um, that completely floors many of our readers. Um, so I would try to you know, get some way around that if the authors left that in, which they might well not have done. Um, so there's all that type of stuff. Um, there are other interesting things like that, that, that I've picked up from, from teaching. Um, idioms can floor these kind of readers. And the whole point is to keep them reading once they've started reading a quick read. Of course, yeah. And the beginning is particularly important. Um, I've, I've been in a class uh, reading well, with the students reading and we got to an author who wrote in a bit of dialogue, somebody said, the grass is greener. Now there was a class of about 15 students. One of them knew what that meant. The others said, what's all this about grass? You know, it just didn't, wasn't something they knew about. Or the expression catch 22. There's lots of stuff like that that I look out for and suggest a way around it. Um, uh, let's think there's the overall plot has to be very, very clear. I was listening to the writers earlier, and this year's books are fantastic, I must say. They've all got great stories. And it was interesting to hear them say, I think it was particularly, um, what's, what's her name, Katie Ford, <clears throat> that she just, write, she just wrote one plain story. There weren't a lot of subplots like in her bigger books. Um, yeah. that's, that's a really good thing, I think, for these books. And I try to, I mean, occasionally I run into a bit where I don't understand the plot myself, or there's a, what seems like a, a mistake. And it's quite fun, actually, then I get back to the publisher and they say, oh my God, you know, we should have done that. And they go back to the author who usually is pleased. This doesn't happen very often, but it's happened with one or two quite well-known writers who I won't mention. Um, none of this year's, I don't think. Um, so it's, it's just generally making it simple, plain, but not losing the way those people write. But basically, yeah, keeping the writing styles and the voice of the writer, but with accessibility, the, yeah. you know, because I guess, you know, that's the key to quick reads. Yeah, what's so good about quick reads is that, is that the writers are really good writers. Um, and then that's part of the sort of, part of the, of the waterfront, where you've got someone like Purim writing about policemen in Hounslow, and then Katie Ford writing about a young woman learning to cook. Um, it's it, it's great. They all write them those things really well, and you don't want to get in mess up the way they write. It's just to make it simpler. Yeah. If necessary, sometimes they're they're really good, and there's not much to be done. Very often, in fact. Yeah. So um, I think we'll um, go to Claire. You, Claire, you're working with a women's prison. Uh, yeah. In terms of um, if you could tell us a little bit about who you use quick reads with, obviously it's going to be the people within the prison, um, and how you use those quick reads books? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm very honoured to be here tonight. Um, I just want to say I've been running the quick read group at Downview Prison, which is a, a women's prison in Surrey for uh, approximately 200 people. Um, the group is has been running for about four years. And initially, the idea came from trying to encourage ladies with low literacy to see reading as a pleasure rather than a chore. However, it became quite apparent quite quickly that the, everybody um, who loves reading wanted to participate. So we run, prior to COVID, every other week for 45 minutes. And um, 
the group is very diverse. There's all, all different types of characters, as you can imagine. But the common love of reading is what sees us through. And um, the confidence that's been instilled in some of the low level literacy um, participants has been amazing. Yeah, it's something that as part of my role as ambassador, I've seen at um, Channing's Wood Prison in Devon. Uh, yeah. yeah, and the, I've seen the impact of it. So um, how about in, I mean, if we if we come over to you, James, um, in public libraries and public libraries of Ireland, we know are having a tough old time and have them for a while, you know, COVID notwithstanding, it's not been an easy time. Um, has Quick Reads been a project that you've been able to use to draw people back in or to engage people more widely within the community? Uh, not not specifically since the uh, reopening we've not uh, with the new ones coming out we will be focusing on it more as they as they do get released obviously we're getting the uh, those in um into our branches so we'll be using those promoting those to the uh, to our to our readers to get them to get them back in but, so um, the focus that you have a, a, a way of using them when you have been able to use them obviously when libraries have been open oh yeah when, when libraries have been been open the, the main targeted way we use them is during our reading ahead um uh, scheme so we obviously take part in the reading ahead, the reading agencies reading ahead um project every year which i lead on and we do that in partnership with a number of organizations across Thameside. Uh, the main one being the local adult education college uh, so they the tutors there there's two or three tutors who bring all their english students who have uh, lower reading levels or are um speak English as a second language, bring those over to the library, they have a library induction, and we make a point during those inductions to introduce them to quick reads. So we, you know, present them, you know, let them have a look at the quick reads. They can look at, the, they get tours of the library and things like that, but we make a, a specific point of these quick reads because we know they are uh, one of the things that's less of a barrier to entry to, to reading and um, will really benefit them. And then, the tutors after the induction, they'll take a batch of them out with them. They'll take, you know, 20 or 30 different quick reads um, back to the college and they'll use those as part of their um, their curriculum and part of the course. So they'll, they'll integrate the quick reads into their, their teaching. Uh, and it just it, it works brilliantly at getting them initially into the library and reading and then coming back again and again to pick up more stuff as they, they develop that love of reading that stems from starting with quick reads. Um, well, Jinda, I mean, obviously, uh, you're working with teenagers, uh, mostly, I guess. Um, again, um, a group I'm very familiar with, um, and I understand that the, bar the barriers that exist, the difficulties. Um, is there a particular way that you're using quick reads, um, particular groups that you use them with, or do you have any particular strategies that you use within that college framework? Yeah, um, so very similar to James, uh, we really sort of um, work it around the kind of reading ahead, uh, so the reading challenge. Um, so it's kind of like, um, uh, you know, it's, it's centred around that and it's an introduction. It's not just uh, teenagers, so we're, we're, we are looking at, at groups that are, you know, um, ESOL, so English for speakers of uh, other languages. Um, but also um, you, if, uh, foundation learning, um, we, we actually have a lot of international students. Um, so, we, you know, our college has um, uh, quite a lot of students coming from uh, South Korea. Uh, so when they're coming over and they're taking part in the challenge, that means that uh, they, they also get access to the, the quick reads. And it's a fantastic way in which, because they're looking to sort of develop um, their skills in English so it's a really good way in which to sort of uh, to promote that and they enjoy the re uh, you know they enjoy the conciseness of, of the books um, yeah so do you I mean one of the one of the, I mean obviously reading for pleasure is a massive part of this is this is a huge part of uh, promoting reading for pleasure but what sort of barriers have you come across um, as practitioners in your own fields what, what are the sort of barriers that you see obviously language is one um and lack of language is a major one we know that um and do you see any similarities in the groups i mean one of the things what i know that i've seen is it's the po poorer economic socioeconomic backgrounds tend to impact reading anyway but how much of that do you actually see in your roles um and i'll put that out to david first please well yes i mean most of the people i teach are of, of lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, I, I teach in a 
College in Wandsworth, and almost I think all the students are uh, living council flats around there. Um, but it's it, it's just inevitable, I think. Now, you get the occasional what you might call middle class person, but they don't tend to last. I've found they, whereas the rest will cohere into a group. The groups they work very well as a group actually. I've, I've used quick reads. We managed to get enough copies so we each have the same book and we read it around the table a few won't read because they're not so good at reading but they follow it with their fingers or whatever um but there's a kind of camaraderie and they discuss the book and that that's a really good thing in my opinion james what about in Tameside libraries i mean again it's hard to gauge because people aren't going to come in and tell you you know they're, they're so economic background but do you get a sense that it, it works yeah. with a yeah, I mean, Thameside is not is is uh, you know within Greater Manchester is an area of some some um, socio socio economic issues, and um, there is you know quite a lot of the demographic do you know suffer from uh, a variety of uh, of issues, and the one of the things that um, the quick reads uh, I've found through just talking you know talking to people that take part in reading ahead or borrowers in general that use the quick reads uh, that they. Uh, enjoy with them is that quite a lot of them especially like the, the light-hearted sort of things um and the sagas and that sort of the romance very because they're so straightforward they're very low in there's not much conflict or anything like that so get quite a lot of readers who get enough of the, you know the, the the darker side of life in their own personal lives and they really want that that escape and um some of the quick reads being, you know, simple, straightforward, straightforward, the, the gratification and resolution from reading a, a story that's, you know, short and accessible, they, they really appreciate that. And, and um, I think it, it, it works well for, for getting people who um, have so many other barriers and other issues to deal with into, into, into reading. I mean, well, again, one of the things I've seen, particularly with teenagers, one of the biggest barriers is low sort of self it's a lack of self-confidence it's low self-esteem when it comes to reading within children's publishing particularly with an organization called Barrington Stoke I think the the term reluctant readers um, is used quite regularly to cover a kind of wide variety of barriers to reading but low self-esteem lack of self-confidence I mean Claire that's not something you must come across on a regular basis do you have any tips for other practitioners for how we overcome that um, it's how how I manage the group is um, I let the group itself and its dynamic at, at each time to have ownership of the group. So they make the decisions. They make the choices of what book we're going to read next. Um, they see these, they're portable magic, as Neil Gaiman would say. Um, they break down all barriers. There is a stereotype of social um, economic so, with regard to prisoners, but my experience is it's very diverse actually and it's its own little ecosystem but what i've seen is women help other women who struggle to read um to you know to embrace the love of it to increase their confidence and to watch them then develop as james was saying to try other books as well um and yeah it's just it it's an actual honour to run the group. Um, I've learned so much as well. Yeah. But Baljinda, what about within the, the college that you work in? Um, you know, again, I'm, I'm just basing it on my own experience of being told books are boring and all the rest of it and trying to overcome. And a lot of the, particularly the younger ones that I see that sit at the back and don't want to get engaged, it's because they feel too embarrassed to engage because they, they lack the confidence to. How do you overcome that in a college setting? Um, yeah, it's interesting you saying that they were broad because I've got I've got um, this uh, written account from uh, one of our learners, uh, which is Diana, and, uh, and she she she's written a. Uh, um, you know, reading is difficult for me as I get distracted and bored very quickly. But this book, when she was uh, reading uh, Rules for Dating a Romantic Hero, she said, um, but uh, this book was nice to read because it is short, concise and to the point. Um, and, and I think that's what they like, you know, and I think we were talking before about, you know, the plot 
um, it, you, you know, how, how accessible it actually is. Um, so I think like uh, David was saying earlier on, you know, we've, we've tried it where we've got like a, a, a group. So they're reading the, the, the same title and uh, there's actually some uh, really lovely uh, things on the website, uh, which I think are uh, the... Um, I think the the learning resources so for the books so they're, they're sort of like companion pieces so so that you can actually use them um so that works really well so that you you know when you get to a chapter so you can set the questions so they can read those bits and then they can they can they can uh, they, they can have, have that kind of conversation um and i think having that conversation is really important because you know, either if it's through the, the reading diaries that you, you do it from, uh, you know, if you're taking part in reading ahead or if they're just talking to each other. And I think a lot of, you know, particularly for ESOL learners, it's really important to, you know, they may not be having um, a, a chance to um, have that conversation. Uh, some of them are quite time poor. You know, they've got busy lives. They've got children. Uh, you know, some of our, uh, our uh, the students are adults, obviously. Um, uh, they've got children. They're working, and it's just trying to fit in 15, 20 minutes somewhere uh, within that week um, to to sort of uh, devote to to reading. Uh, and that's one of the first things that we will do uh, with the groups. It's just to kind of like discuss. Okay, where's your time for reading? Okay, wh where is it going to be in the week? Where are you going to sort of make sure that you're going to, um, you know, um, keep to it and um, and and make sure that you're going to devote uh, to, to taking part in reading? Yeah. yeah. And one of the things I've noticed on the notes I have here are that um, the quick reads this year are available as ebooks um, and audiobook. It says here as well as paperback. Um, in terms of different formats, if we kind of steer away from paperback, are are you are you finding that you use either the quick reads or other titles um, in kind of other formats? Um, David, are you using them within adult literacy? Do you find that there's a, a take up for ebook or audiobook? Um, I think well, this is quite new. I think that, um, having them as ebooks is a really good thing because, for, particularly for the younger um, students, because they're they're much more facile with their phones and all that stuff. Um, they're more used to that than they are to actual books, um, yeah. you know. Uh, audio books sounds a bit strange to me because that's like listening to the radio or something, which or watching. Well, it's not the same as watching telly, but maybe I'm being a bit old-fashioned. I like the idea of them actually reading <laughs> with the book, you know, or or the laptop or whatever has the the ebook on it. Um, just sitting listening, that's great, but it's. I don't know that it's not, well, it's because I'm focusing on teaching people to, to read and also write, actually. It's reading, writing, and speaking is part of the curriculum, too, you probably know. Um, so I'm not so impressed by the idea of them being audio books, but that's okay. You know. James, do you find within Thameside Libraries that, that, do you think those two formats will go down well or will be particularly useful? Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, especially well, one of the... One of the uh, positives, or if you can say that, out of the uh, the pandemic is that uh, e-book and e-audiobook lending has gone absolutely through the roof. And even though we've been open for a number of months now with, for people to come and borrow physical books, the the numbers haven't, you know, the, the, the keeping up there, I mean, they've dropped slightly, but they are, the e-book lending and e-audiobook lending is, is is staying up there because people have were forced to, to discover them when they didn't have another option and realised, oh, actually, it's not, such hard work to get this app on my phone and type in my library card number and take two seconds to download hundreds of books if, if, if the, the whim took them. Um, in terms of uh, the, uh, using quick reads and the, the reading ahead scheme that we have, um, slight anecdote was uh, I do introduce um, our ebook service to the, uh, to the participants that come in for the library inductions and to get introduced to quick reads and reading ahead. And as I was you know, introducing what, what we had and showing them how to do it. There was a someone who'd already was already familiar with it. One of the uh, students from the the college just took over and just because she was familiar with all the people there, just told them to get all the phones out and took them through how to do it. So there are some people that are incredibly keen and in, uh, uh, getting those ebooks and sharing the 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 benefits of having them. The so many books so accessible at any time, really. 
Um, Claire, what about um, in your role? Are you are you finding particularly? I mean, audio book. I, I find audio book interesting because I don't really listen to them, but I've recently got into listening to lots of podcasts, and um, it's a particular way of taking um, stories, ideas, thoughts in. So, do you find that that works with some of your? Um, we're not allowed any access to ebooks or podcasts, so we're strictly limited to old school paper, which uh, I'm quite happy with. So, and the ladies are as well. So, yeah, we we have no no access to anything. Audio would be good, but I'm not sure what the cost involved would be for that. So, um, audio books have had a slight resurgence over lockdown in the library um, at the moment. So. That's a positive. So maybe we could introduce some quick reads via the audio. I think that'd be really good. We do use, the ladies do actually read aloud within the session, um, but that's as far as we get. No yeah. no podcasts, I'm afraid. I do have another ambassador hat uh, for an organization called Listening Books. So I'm actually very interested in what all four of you've got to say really about this. Um, oh, I... um, what about within, again, the college framework? I guess audio books are a part of that. Yeah, we're getting increasingly um, asked for audiobooks. So the, the, the younger students are really, really keen to sort of, and, and particularly also um, um, to, to make it more inclusive, uh, you know, for, for foundation learning uh, to be able to access. So, um, so yeah, definitely audiobooks are, are, are definitely key. And if, if you think about it, you think about the success of like podcasts and, and people sort of um, accessing those. So it's, it's a similar kind of, um, you know, I think David is right. It is a bit, a bit like listening to the radio in the background, but I think people want to sort of like almost like multitask. So they're kind of like doing something else and then they're kind of like listening, uh, listening away. Um, and I think with the ebooks, um, I think the advantage there really, if you are, are using the ebooks, is that you can you can get um, uh, learners to um, use some of the features. So things like um, uh, like highlighting so like if there's tricky sections etc so you can sort of highlight the the actual text you can get them to sort of write comments on uh, which which is really useful so they're, they're actually really sort of making a really quite you know they're really getting into the reading and and they're, and they're making uh, use of it there and also all of the accessibility features that you have you know you really you know to making the text bigger um, the 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 uh, actual you, you know the, the the filters are colors that you can sort of arrange so it, it really is so it's definitely an area that we're, we're like, uh, looking to sort of you know uh, move people across yeah okay. um we're kind of heading very quickly towards the time we're going to take some q a there are some very interesting questions uh, particularly about prisons here which we'll get to um in a, in a short while um as this is about practitioners you're all four of you are practitioners doing a great job um what advice what what one bit of advice would each of you give to fellow practitioners sort of across the board think who are thinking who have maybe joined in today but thinking about using quick reads or using them in a different way if they're already using them um and i'm going to be really mean and start with james uh thanks for that <laughs> oh. um I don't know whether it's advice, but just one of the benefits, if someone's thinking about getting quick reads, I'd, I'd say that there's so many different variety, so many different variety of ways in which you can use them. I mean, we've mentioned, uh, you know, adults with lower reading, le reading levels, ESOL students, uh, things like that. But they're also like a really good bridge for um, your, your young adults going from like teenage, what we in the library, we have teenage section and we have adult section in the, li in the public libraries. So a good bridge from going from teen to adult if they're not, you know, sure. Uh, they're also brilliant for if you're trying to, we have um, quite regularly, we have someone, we have people coming to the library and they'll say, oh, I've read all Peter James's books. Have you got anything that's similar? I'm like, well, this person's not exactly the same, but similar, but he's done a quick read. Why don't you try that quick read first? Or I'm getting a bit, someone says, I'm a bit bored of, you know, um, golden age of crime books. I want to try something else I'm like well rather than going into you know 600 page fantasy fiction why don't you try this quick fantasy book and uh, maybe that'll, that'll get you there uh, so it's a ver very versatile tools yeah um, okay uh Baljinda, what about within the college 
Yeah, I think that, it, that they're fantastic to sort of introduce um, learners to different genres. Um, so like, you know, so, so I, I think this is one of the strange things about um, going through the lockdowns and COVID is that we, we've had to sort of, um, whereas previously we would have asked uh, learners just to kind of like go to the shelf and maybe have, have a rummage and kind of like choose things for themselves. Um, we've had to sort of like really sort of uh, display them uh, and lay them out. So some, it's, uh, and I think that's quite a useful thing to, to be able to sort of, um, uh, you know, introduce them to the collection, uh, put them out uh, and allow learners to sort of look at the, the cover and then kind of like have a read of, of the blurb um, uh, before they're, they're actually choosing. Um, and, I, and I think that's, that's not something that we did prior to, <laughs> you know, we would have allowed them to sort of just go, be, but because of all the kind of like strict rules that we've had to sort of put into place uh, is something that we're going to sort of continue doing. Um, but I think, yeah, introduce them um, and introduce, you know, choose a selection of them and, and let uh, learners sort of kind of like uh, choose um, what, you know, is, it, is, it, is attractive to them in, in a sense, yeah. Uh, um, in terms of any advice that you'd give, I mean, one of the, the interesting things that you said that I made a note of is the idea of allowing the group ownership of the group. And um, is there any other advice that you'd give practitioners? Um, again, it's just simply to repeat that, really. <laughs> just let the group have ownership. As Bajinda was saying, just let the group choose their books, uh, the reasons why they're choosing it, what appeals to them, the title, the blurb. Um, and sort of take it from there really um, but at all times it should be their group and we simply facilitate it. Great okay <laughs> sorry. No that's okay. <laughs> um, and David um, slightly different question it's another one we've got noted down um, this is this for yourself what would the top tips what would your top tips be for ensuring that the resources are accessible for this audience? What well, in prison? Oh sorry. Sorry for David. Um, sorry. No, I don't mind. Um, yeah, I think one key thing is is to bear in mind if you're if you're teaching um, adult adults using books that when you first introduce them, um, some of these people have never read a book before, or, or or possibly even held one in their hands. And I, because with my own classes, I can introduce them. But I was once asked to go to somebody else's class and take some quick reads with me because they knew I had them and I handed them around and people looked at them and then I went out with the teacher and we just left them reading came back in and one woman was painstakingly reading the copyright page if you know what I mean the the very boring page that comes I've got Katie Ford's book here this this page the the tedious thing and, and you know she was painstakingly deciphering that and people you, I just advising other teachers or whoever to make sure people know how to get their way into a book just to get to page one rather than read a lot of rubbish about um, you know the legal niceties and the copyright who owns the copyright um, so that's just one thing that bear in mind that you are working or, or, or I have anyway and I think a lot of people do with people who, who are totally unfamiliar with books and and as others have said, um, let them play around with them, look at the back, read the blurb um, before they choose one. Okay, great. So we're going to head into the Q&A. We've got some, there's a couple of questions about prisons, actually, Claire. So I think these might be heading in your direction first, but it, it'd be great to get the, the thoughts of the rest of the panel on these as well. The first one is from Robin Eldred. Um, hi there from the charity Women in Prison. If we were to set up a book club for service users based in the community, what book would you suggest as our first read? So we'll go to Claire and then we'll go to the others in the panel. And if we could be as brief as possible so we can get some of the other questions. Yeah, in that I would recommend A Street Cat Called Bob for the women in prison um, if they were going to set up their book group, uh, simply because many of our ladies have been in the situation as James Bowen and been homeless. Um, Many of our ladies have adopted on animals on the street as well. So um, I think it is a, a something that they could all relate to or many could relate to and resonate with. And at the very least, you're all going to love Bob. There you go. So, uh, James, is there a particular one that you, you would suggest? Um, 
you've caught me off guard here because I was trying to find the name of the title of the one that I was thinking of. It is the, it's an Agatha, it's a, it's a, a collection of Agatha Christie short stories that was turned into a quick read. Is it di something about Diamond or Jewel? I can't remember. Oh, hang on. Please, I'll play. The what's um, that? Okay, but it's, it's an Agatha Christie one, so we yes, can... Yes, it is, and it's a collection of short crime stories. It's got that instant, you know, the, it's a quick who done it's that instant gratification of the, the puzzle and then the solution yeah. really quickly. And it's, it's like, it's like watching a, reading a magic trick. So I, I find it when you're reading stuff like Agatha Christie, where you're like the whodunits and someone will, Poirot will unravel that, that mystery that you, you didn't think could be unraveled. Yeah. And it's just, I just find that fascinating. I always recommend uh, stuff like that. Okay, Balgender, is there one in particular you would recommend? Um, the Too Good To Be True by uh, Anne, I think Anne Cleves. That was uh, yeah. one that was really popular that we did as like a kind of like a reading kind of circle. Um, if I can choose another one, it's the short story ones. Um, so, you know, the, uh, the compilation of short stories, um, they are really popular uh, because I think they, they, they just want to sort of be able to sort of, it, it helps them to sort of get through the kind of like book quicker almost so that like reading short parts, yeah. Yeah. samplers of samplers i mean james was saying earlier about using them as samples for samplers for authors yeah so um now david obviously is uh, as an as a the literacy editor for quick reads you know i guess you've seen a hell of a lot of them which is there is there are there any is there one in particular that you would think would stand out um for a and the, the question is for a book club for service users based within the community um so mm -hmm. that's really in prison I was going to just put in a word for non-fiction because there's yeah there's, yeah right. yeah there's usually one non-fiction and there is this year which is Caitlin Moran um, who wasn't actually there but uh, her book's hilarious particularly for women obviously because it's called I put it here how to be a woman um, but uh, other non-fiction I I was going to recommend this was last year Adam Kay's yeah see it um, this is going to which, which is very, very funny about him being a doctor in the NHS and what a nightmare it is and how little time he has for his private life and all the hilarious things that happen. Just, you know, the weird things, people come in and complain that they've got wrong with them. Um, all that stuff, that's brilliant. And just echoing um, Belgender who talked about short stories, this, there was a book that I used a long time ago now, one of the earlier um, quick reads, which was John Simpson's. Um, it was called 20 Tales from the War Zone, and I think it came from his own, he, he wrote his autobiography and then the quick read editor very quick, cleverly, Fanny Blake, but somebody who, else who used to do that job, got him to do this. And there are 20 short stories that are true. And it was interesting that people, people knew about some of this stuff, like Iraq, um, uh, John Simpson met Saddam, he met Gaddafi, um, all those kind of things and, and it seemed to intrigue and also it's got that thing of each story is about eight pages maybe which you can do in a, in one lesson with them and then talk about it uh so that went really well so non-fiction and short short stories as well as the novels there's, there's such great novels too great variety so yeah. okay the what uh, the second question on the q a is from ruth carlisle now with reading groups particularly in prisons do people in the group see participation as a well-being benefit or are they predominantly interested in the stories? And again, I'm going to go back to Claire with this to begin with. That's a fantastic question. Um, I would say initially it's definitely for the story. However, as I've seen groups evolve, um, it's for the well-being. And that actually includes my own, to be honest. <laughs> They've, um, yeah, it's definitely the story that captures everybody. That breaks down the barriers and then from that I've seen um, well-being enhanced by you know just being with each other supporting each other helping each other to read um, so yeah it ticks both boxes but definitely the story first and foremost. Okay uh, Baljinda what about um, your experience of that? Of the, um, yeah I, I, I think that that it, I think just going back to that point, it's it's uh, you know with the, with the print books, it's it's just that kind of that experience of being able to um, you, you know master you know if it's eighty pages or nearly a hundred pages, being able to sort of and and it's just giving that kind of confidence um, really um, 
that, that they can do that and then they can sort of bridge that over onto like a a, a larger a larger or a longer uh, a longer read and I, and I think in the video uh, you would have probably heard um, one of our learners, um, uh, Katazina, talk about, you know, she'd never re read um, uh, anything other, uh, you know, she'd only, only read Polish books. And this is the first time that she had read uh, like a book in English. Um, and that led her to read, you know, 12 more books um, as, as, as a result of that. So, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. James? Um, at both, completely both, because I have, uh, I think it's about eight readers groups that I I'm involved with same side libraries. We have some some libraries have two two uh, two readers groups. Some just have one. But um, there's about eight that I'm involved with, and some of the groups there's a there's a, a couple that are very into the the stories and the books, and they, they do the the readers group thing quite systematically and and um, uh, and really you know analyze the text and things like that and take it quite from a literary perspective whereas there's others where you might talk about the book for 10 or 15 minutes but the whole point is that you've got that shared experience of reading it and you you end up sharing life stories and things like that and it's the reading is just a gateway for for meeting people to then to have that the shared experience of reading the book as the foundation and then you can build a relationship and you know the well-being benefits of that come come with it yep and david uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, where, where I teach, and probably most colleges, um, the, the class is quite long and there's a tea break in the middle. And if you do a bit of reading before that of one of these books, then they'll all come to the tea break and chat away about it. And, and I go along too. And, and that all promotes, um, you know, camaraderie and good feeling. And if somebody hasn't understood something, that can be explained, hopefully not by me, but by one of the others. Um, so it's yeah, the, the story is the thing, and, the, and they want to talk about it. Yeah, well, obviously, you know, reading, reading well, reading for pleasure, uh, high levels of literacy, you know, and well being, whether it's again, we talked about socioeconomics earlier, but just general well being, we know, um, that the, the findings are there that show us people are kind of happier, less likely to be stressed out, um, if they're readers. So, I th there is a, a question here, the next one is from it says, anonymous attendee. Um, and it made me smile when I saw it. Again, it's prison based, but we're going to widen this out. So at a prison library, is there a limit on the genre, genres of books that can be read? I imagine books about crime wouldn't be available, for example. Obviously, Claire, you're going to have to answer that one first. <laughs> No, books about crime are available. Um, the thriller books, Peter James, obviously one of the most popular um, authors, is very well read. Um, it actually is a positive thing because those that read them can see from perhaps a victim's point of view or another, they, they develop more empathy for, for you know, how people may feel after a crime. Um, yeah, it's just a, it, nothing is prohibited. Um, so yeah, we, we enjoy a thriller as much as anybody else. We've been fortunate because Dorothy Coonson and Tammy Cohen have written their thriller books and they've come in to visit us. So, um, and they've inspired the ladies quite, quite a lot actually. So, um, yeah. Great. Okay. Um, Baljinder, is there a particular genre um, that you find is more popular than others with the groups you went with? Yeah, across the board, really. Um, they, they really do sort of choose whatever they like i mean we, we still we still have the doctor who uh, there's some doctor who ones so that they're, they're still popular um the um david was mentioning about the non-fiction i think there's one about money money i can't remember the name <laughs> but uh, there's quite a few that that you know about self-improvement and and etc um so yeah across the board really i would say you know so uh, and, and and i think that is if, if you do that if you actually sort of let people sort of choose um, and it's, it's quite interesting, the kind of conversations that you have um, afterwards um, that, have, that are kind of like triggered from um, uh, uh, reading, uh, reading the book. Yeah. yeah. James, is there a particular genre that, uh, with quick reads that works better than others? Or uh, With quick reads specifically, um, uh, I think, that, as I said, the, the, the quick conflict resolution of a, a crime one, that quick solution works really well. 
Uh, I mentioned earlier about the feel good stuff, just that pure escapism, you know, no conflict, just, you know, all, all, all positive vibes you get from uh, from some some books like like Katie Ford's that I thought things go really go down really well. Um, I think that's that's from the quick reads. Yeah, those are the, the two main ones that just get when we do the in, in, library inductions with groups of uh, reading ahead participants. They just just get devoured off the shelves. There's there's nothing left. Oh, and the, I just will agree that the, the the Doctor Who ones. Anything that's got a movie or a TV tie in. Like that familiarity that's already there with if they if they're already used to those characters, it's just a, a, another barrier that's not that's not in the way to to absorb in that book. And I mean that's just a, can only be a good thing. Yeah, my eight year old is reading through every Star Wars book she can get her hands on them because we've yeah, been watching. Yeah, they don't stay on the shelves. That's it. Yeah, um, David, is there a particular genre that, that you um, feel we need more of and we talked about non-fiction I don't know quite what the balance is between fiction and non-fiction with quick reads but in your with, with your literacy editor hat on for the series or for the project yeah, a little bit more non-fiction uh, most years there's five fiction and one non-fiction um, possibly a little more uh, um, other ones that went down well like Malala's book um, uh, Malala Yusuf Say, I think her name is um, they like that kind of thing because they're aware of her and she's been on TV. Um, and just to go back to what Claire was saying about prisoners, I've had one or two ex-prisoners in my class and, and they do go for um, crime books. And, and I think it's a good thing, actually. I mean, I'm echoing what she's, she's much more of an expert um, because there's, because on the whole, the, well, this is my simplistic view. The, the villain gets his comeuppance and it's better not to be a criminal is, could be the message from, most of them. They also like um, Andy McNabb did very well for me in, with with those kind of readers. Not that I have that many ex um, convicts, uh, but a lot of men like Andy McNabb and and one or two of those other SAS guys who who've done quick reads. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so we are almost out of time. We've got a couple of minutes, so we're going to have to be quick with this one. Um, obviously, COVID, uh, lockdowns, etc. cetera. Um, don't need to go into it too much, but um, how wide-ranging has the impact been um, on your particular group? So I'm going to, you've got literally 30 seconds each for this, so sorry to throw this at the end. Um, but how, how big an impact has it been um, on the groups that you... Um, work with um, and you know do you think this year is going to sort of get get those people back on track if they've sort of fallen uh, behind at all? Uh, Belgender obviously colleges have been closed quite a lot so yeah, it's been really, tr really tricky, uh, obviously, this year, uh, but we have managed to sort of get some groups uh, through the uh, Reading Ahead Challenge and, um, and uh, I, th I think like uh, I've I may have mentioned previously, we've had to be really, really strict. So it's a case of like getting the books out, getting them in. Either they're wearing gloves or they're just pointing, you know, they're just pointing to the book. They say, oh, we'll, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll get that one for you. Um, so really sort of like looking forward to sort of, uh, you know, moving back and then probably sort of exploring more of the kind of like the e-books that have been popular um, of, over this um, period. We're almost out of time. Just very quickly, James, yeah, um, with public libraries, because again, there's been a big impact, hasn't there? So, yeah, it just completely derailed everything. Um, it, there was we, we couldn't run reading ahead because our partner organisations, the colleges, and the ESOL groups were completely out of action. I did put feelers out to a, to other people that might be interested, and from that, we have got a, a an adult learner virtual readers group started started last month, which I'm pleased with. And I've got loads of people lined up for September when we can restart as well. So that's a pos at least a positive. Loads of new people coming in for the reading head and to get introduced to quick reads. Okay. Well, sadly, we are out of time. Um, I, I did, I've been writing questions down and I've got like three more that I would have thrown in. Um, I just want to say thank you to the panellists. Thank you to all four of you. Um, it's a fascinating discussion. As somebody that's worked as an ambassador um, and been involved with various aspects of this, just I, almost as an outsider, I go in and I speak to people. It's practitioners such as yourself that are doing the really, really great work. Uh, um, so thank you for that. Thank you for taking part today. Uh, we've got quite a lot, a large audience, and I'm sure they've taken a lot from it. Um, to everyone that's listening in as well, thank you very much. Thank you for taking part and for joining in. Um, it's been a pleasure to host it. I'm Bally Wright, and we'll see you again sometime. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you. So I get the huge pleasure of saying thank you and, and good night to everybody. Thank you, Bally, Claire, James, Baljinda and David, and for all the hard work that you do throughout the year um, for everybody, uh, not just through Quick Reads, but the work that you do. Um, and thank you to our Quick Reads authors. Do go and borrow one from your public library, download one and definitely buy one because for every copy sold, the publishers are amazingly gifting a copy that at the reading agency, we will directly put into the hands of people all across the country who face barriers and challenges to reading. So a final thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. Apologies for our technical glitch over the video. We're really going to try and run it again uh, in just a few moments, but we'll definitely make it available. And finally, please join me in raising a glass to the fantastic new titles of 2021, but also to 15 years of quick reads. Uh, long may it continue to have such a life-changing impact. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.